Hello, Mary and Paul and everyone at the Israeli Origami Center. I'm delighted to have been asked to contribute to the Teacher Day at Pisgah Tel Aviv, and I hope you're having a great time so far. Uh, my name is Eric Demain, and I'm a professor at MIT in computer science, and I study a field called computational origami, which is about using mathematics and geometry and computers to um, analyze and design uh, cooler and new origami. Uh, and I thought it'd be fun to talk about this in the context of the Krembo uh, because it's kind of uh, tricky to wrap a shape like this. It's a kind of origami folding from a sheet of tin foil into a curved three-dimensional shape. Uh, I've got a sort of spherical part on the top and a cylindrical part on the bottom. Uh, how is that possible with a sheet of material? And so this actually led to some really interesting mathematical uh, formulations of uh, paper or tinfoil wrapping. I thought I'd tell you about that. First though, I want to give you a little bit of context for how uh, computational origami has gone up to this point of uh, computational confectionery and folding of, uh, of chocolates, or wrapping of chocolates. These are two designs. Both of them are folded from one square of paper with no cuts. Uh, I've got a three-headed Cerberus on the bottom and uh, a dragon with about a thousand scales. This, I'm told, took about a year to fold. Both are made and designed by Satoshi Kamiya, a leading young Japanese uh, origami designer. And these are two examples of the modern revolution in complex origami design. This has all happened within the last uh, few decades. And so it's been really amazing what uh, feats have been possible on the origami art side. And this has been made possible from the origami science and understanding uh, the geometry of how you can contort a square of paper into uh, various animals and creations with many different limbs of different lengths and sizes and do things like scales and so on. Uh, so there's a, a rich mathematical theory here. Uh, an example of a result in the computational origami world is called Orgamizer. This is originally software by Tomohiro Tachi and it's a, then an algorithm that the two of us uh, developed. And the idea is you give as input to this computer program or the algorithm uh, a three-dimensional shape, the surface that you've designed on your computer. This is a classic model called the Stanford Bunny. You give that to the software. It says, okay, here is the way to fold your bunny. This is a photograph of a real model. Uh, you take a square of paper. It's not drawn here, but it's a square that contains all of these creases. The solid lines are mountains. The dashed lines are valleys. You fold along all of those lines. It takes about 10 hours and you get exactly the bunny as you drew it originally. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. You can use this to fold any 3D shape you want, and really out of almost any material. This is a folding out of paper, uh, but here's another example folded out of one sheet of steel. Uh, this is Steel has been laser cut with a high-powered laser cutter at MIT. Uh, this is Tomohiro visiting MIT and folding it. Uh, we've cut out some holes in the center to reduce the accumulation of layers, because uh, Steel is a lot thicker than paper. Um, he's wearing gloves to prevent uh, cutting himself. Um, and it, it, this also took about 10 hours, even though it's a lower resolution model, less, less uh, triangles in the bunny. Uh, but in the end, we get exactly the desired bunny surface out of one sheet of steel. So in principle, you can use this technique to fold any 3D shape you want. Um, and so this is all, all pretty new and exciting, and we'll, we're Curious to see where it goes. Um, a sort of different approach, although still folding along straight lines uh, into interesting 3D shapes, is uh, this origami robot. This is a self-folding sheet of material. Uh, it has, it's been pre-scored along various lines, and it's made of various plastics and uh, electronics layers and so on. And it has uh, little uh, muscles, which are really shape memory alloy, uh, when you heat them up, they pull creases shut. And so we just made an origami boat like you would out of a newspaper. The same sheet, we can send it two different signals and fold an origami airplane. And so the underlying mathematics here is if you take a rectangular uh, sheet of paper with uh, square grid lines and alternating diagonals, this is called box pleating in origami, you can prove it can fold any shape as long as that shape is made out of little cubes. And the finer the resolution of your grid, uh, the more cubes you can make. Here we're making a paper airplane out of a 4x4 grid and a boat out of the same 4x4 grid, but in the future you can imagine a robot that can completely transform its shape, kind of like 
transformers, but made out of origami. You have a square of material, maybe this thing, I push a button, it unfolds and refolds into whatever other 3D shape you want. Um, so kind of a universal gadget, or it's called programmable matter, lots of interesting things. Um, but using one crease pattern to fold many different shapes is the idea. But that was straight creases. With curved creases, you can reach a whole new range of forms. And this is not very well understood mathematically. Uh, we're still trying to figure out the details of how curved creases work. Um, and towards that goal, we actually fold sculpture to help understand the mathematics. Uh, so these are three examples of sculptures that my dad, Martin Domain, and I made. Um, and these are fairly simple foldings. It's, you take a circle of paper with a circular hole and you crease concentric circles, alternating mountain valley, mountain valley. And you fold multiple such circles and combine them together. The idea of circle folding goes back to the Bauhaus in the late 20s. Uh, and so we've been looking at what hap how these shapes change when you combine multiple circles together and kind of weave them and squeeze them around. And then you let go and the paper just relaxes into these 3D forms all by itself. It's, we call it self-folding origami. It's really cool and exciting. We're still trying to figure it out mathematically, but so far what we get are lots of interesting sculptures um, in, this, in this world. Um, so we've seen straight crease folding, uh, which makes polyhedral surfaces, surfaces where all the sides are polygons, uh, flat sides. We've seen curved creases. With curved creases, um, the sides aren't flat. They're what's called developable. Uh, so the idea with a developable surface is that some paper here. Uh, you can fold something like a, it's called a generalized cylinder, or you could fold something called a generalized cone like this. Um, but you're still limited in exactly what kind of surfaces you can make. In particular, you cannot make spheres. And yet there are spherical chocolates, like the Mozart Kugel, is wrapped with a flat sheet of tinfoil, and the Krembo, which has half of a sphere on it. So how are these things wrapped when it's theoretically impossible, even with curved creases, and there's really no creases, there's crinkling, though. So how can we model crinkling mathematically? So this led to a new area of research. Initially, we were motivated by the Mozart Kugel. This is the first uh, perfectly spherical chocolate, apparently, invented in the early 1900s uh, in Salzburg. It, uh, Mozart Kugel just means Mozart sphere. Uh, and so normally with origami, we define... Uh, we define a folding as a kind of mapping from the piece of paper to three dimensions. And normally that mapping should satisfy two constraints. Uh, one is continuity, which means that the piece of paper uh, can't be torn anywhere. So you can't, you can't tear it. Uh, this would be invalid for folding. You've got to stay connected. Uh, and the second condition is that you should be isometric, meaning that you can't stretch the paper. And also, you can't squish it. If I squish the paper, uh, it has to go into the third dimension. So that's, that's considered not really stretching or not really squishing because uh, if you measure distances along the surface of the paper, it's still just as long as it used to be because of the sizing in the paper. Uh, these two things are generally true. And we're assuming here zero thickness paper, perfect mathematical paper. Uh, this prevents folding things like a sphere out of finite, with finitely many creases, you can't make a sphere because it's kind of curved in two dimensions. Um, so instead, we propose wrapping, where we just remove this last condition about shrinking and say, well, you're allowed to shrink. And in practice, shrinking is going to happen by lots of little tiny infinitesimal crinkles. Um, but we still require no stretching, because you still can't make paper bigger than it is. That would cause it to tear. So no tearing, no stretching. But for contractive wrappings, we allow shrinking. And this makes it possible to fold the sphere. Uh, so we wrote this paper called Wrapping the Mozart Kugel. This is with my dad, Martin Domain, and two colleagues, John Iacono and Stefan Langerman. And uh, here's one example of a wrapping, kind of the simplest and also probably the worst that I'll show you. Uh, here we have a sphere. And to scale, we have the disk that would fold into this sphere. So it's a pretty big disk. And the idea is we're going to take all of these radial lines from the center of the disk to uh, the perimeter. And each of those lines is going to map to one of these uh, arcs. I guess you could call them longitudinal arcs. If this is the North Pole and then the background there is the South Pole, then these would be longitudinal lines on the sphere. Each of those is going to map to one of these. 
Uh, and you can check this is actually contractive mapping. It's not trivial to prove that, but it's true. And uh, how good is it? Well, the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi if we have a radius 1 circle. And so this, I'm going to rewrite all my areas in terms of multiples of pi squared for reasons we'll see later. So this turns out to be 1.27 pi squared. That's the best you could hope for. That's the amount of material you have to have. But because we have to contract things, you can't really achieve this. You need to be at least a little bit above 1.27 pi squared. Now, this disk has radius pi because uh, each of these longitudinal lines from the North Pole to the South Pole has size pi because going all the way around would have 2 pi. Uh, so uh, the area here turns out to be pi cubed, which if we rewrite as a multiple of pi squared is 3.1415 whatever times pi squared. So there's a big gap here, and you might wonder, can I use less material than 3.14 times pi squared? Uh, and the answer is yes. If you look at the Mirabel Mozart Kugel, this is the uh, most popular brand of Mozart Kugel. They make most of the Mozart Kugel in, in the world. Um, then they actually use a pi by 2 pi rectangle, uh, which has area 2 pi squared, uh, which is a lot better than 3.14 pi squared. So they use a lot less material. It's still not optimal, uh, or it doesn't match the lower bound, because uh, it's impossible to match the lower bound. Uh, how does it actually work? Well, if you look at a sphere and take the long side of the rectangle and wrap it around the equator of the sphere here, that has length 2 pi, so that's why this has to be 2 pi long. And then we're going to crush the top half of the rectangle to fill the top part of the sphere and crush the bottom half to fill the bottom part of the sphere. And it turns out uh, if you measure, like say, from the, from the middle here up to the North Pole, that has length uh, pi over 2 because you're going one quarter around the entire sphere. And so that's why from the middle here up to the top is only pi over 2. So you only need to be pi tall, 2 pi long, area 2 pi squared. Of course, to discover this, we had to do extensive experimentation and, and unwrap and, of course, eat many Mozart Kuglin. Uh, so it's a lot of fun research. Uh, there's another company that makes Mozart Kugel, though. These are actually the, the first company to make Mozart Kugel. Uh, it's called Fürst. And uh, this is in Salzburg. These are a lot harder to get, but generally taste better, although they are less spherical, so they're less mathematically perfect. They use a different wrapping uh, from a square of material instead of a rectangle. And the square turns out to be dimensioned root 2 pi by root 2 pi, which if you multiply out, gives you 2 pi squared again, which is very curious. This is exactly 2 pi squared. Huh. Why is that? Um, so first of all, how does this work? Uh, the idea is you take the center of the square, you put it on the north pole of the sphere, and then we've got these four corners of the square. We're going to wrap them around to the south pole of the sphere. Uh, so here's, for example, what it looks like after you folded two corners to the, uh, to the south pole. When we fold all four corners, there'll be four 90-degree angles coming together, which adds up to 360. So we perfectly cover the south pole of the sphere. Uh, in reality, of course, you'd want a larger square and a larger rectangle than what I'm showing you uh, to have some overlap and so you don't have little gaps in the folding. But for mathematical purity, I'm going to imagine you just have to barely cover that south pole. Okay, uh, so how big does the square have to be? Well, uh, we're making here one full longitudinal circle with the diagonal of the paper. So the diagonal has to be length 2 pi. And so that works out to a root 2 pi by root 2 pi square. Uh, very curious, this is exactly the same area as the rectangle. We'll see later on why that happens. But you know, is this optimal? Is 2 pi squared some magic number? Uh, no. Turns out with a triangle, you can do a little bit better. And I really mean a little bit better, 0.1%. We thought for sure triangles would be a lot worse or a lot better. But they are just tiny, tiny, tiny bit better than wrapping with a square at least for the best triangle wrapping that we know, uh, we get 1.998 times pi squared. And to sort of look inside the triangle and see what's going on, uh, what we've done is the same kind of idea with the square wrapping, uh, where we took the center and we put it on the north pole, and then we want to take the three corners and wrap the south pole with them. The trouble with a triangle, though, is you only have 60 degrees of material at each of these vertices, uh, so when you add 3 times 60, you only get 180 instead of 360, which is what we need. So you have to kind of cut off those, those corners. You can't really use them as they are. 
And instead we use these blue shapes, which are call, we call petals, and they're uh, a little hard to express mathematically, but uh, what they do is each of them covers one third of the sphere, and you can see that from the angle here uh, being uh, 120, and you take three of them, you get exactly 360. So these guys will cover the south poles of the sphere. All of the yellow stuff gets contracted away, isn't necessary for the folding. You could either put it in your material, like we did with the triangle, or you could just remove all of those yellow regions. If you remove the yellow regions, you're going to use a lot less material. Now, one nice thing about the equilateral triangle uh, is that it tiles the plane. So if you're going to make a lot of uh, Mozart Kugel, uh, you can cut out lots of triangles from one sheet. Uh, but this blue shape tiles pretty well as well. You can, there are some gaps if you put them against each other. But even taking into account the gaps, the amount of material usage here is 20% less than the existing Mozart Kugel wrappings, the square and the rectangle. That's a substantial savings. You know, there's lots and lots of chocolates made in the world. We could reduce the amount of material wastage. Uh, so very practical research here. <laughs> of course, we're doing it for fun. Um, so that's tiling. Um, in fact, we studied many different uh, wrappings of the Mozart Kugel. Definitely not all of them. Uh, but in general, we like to categorize them in terms of two parameters. The y-axis here is the area, the amount of material you use. That's what I've been talking about so far. The x-axis is the perimeter of the shape. This is how much cutting you'd have to do to cut out each shape. Intuitively, you'd like to minimize perimeter as well as area. So we'd like things down here in the lower left corner because that will be low perimeter and low area. So uh, what are some of the wrappings here? We've got, on the one hand, our triangle wrapping. Uh, which is this little triangle point here. So it's got pretty low perimeter, pretty low area. Um, if we take instead uh, just this blue part and ignore the yellow part, I believe we get this point, which has quite a bit less area, uh, but the perimeter goes up. On the other hand, if we remove just these yellow corners and leave these yellow corners, we get this point. This is probably my favorite wrapping uh, because it has the lowest perimeter of any wrapping that we've ever seen. It has perimeter way over here. Uh, it looks like about 17 perimeter. Uh, the area is not great. It's like a little bit more than 18, um, but it's not too bad. Now, the minimum possible perimeter is way down here, uh, about 12 and a half. This is the perimeter of a sphere. And if you'd use these kinds of wrappings, not with three petals or six petals, but with more and more and more petals, you'll get, uh, in the limit, you get the optimal amount of surface area. Uh, but your perimeter goes to infinity. You get tons and tons of perimeter. This is totally impractical from a cutting perspective. Uh, but there you go. Incidentally, a uh, fun thing about this picture is if you take four petals and divide the sphere in four parts, and then take the bounding rectangle, this is the pi by two pi Mirabel wrapping. Whereas if you take, I haven't drawn it here, but if you take four petals and arrange them in a flower pattern like this, that's why we call them petals, and take the bounding square, that is the first square wrapping. And so the petals, of course, have the same area, and it just happens because of the, the geometry that if you add it up as a rectangle or add them up as a square, you get the same area. So that's why the two existing Mozart Kugel wrappings have the same area here. The, one of these wrappings is the square and rectangle wrapping. We can do better either in terms of area, uh, in terms of area, or in terms of perimeter. So that's why I think this uh, wrapping would be particularly good. All right, enough about the Mozart Kugel. Uh, on to the Krembo. So uh, I don't know how carefully you've unwrapped these, but if we take a Krembo, we've got this is a little bit deflated, but we've got the round part on the top and the cylindrical part or the circle on the bottom. And from what I can tell, the corners of the rectangle of material all typically come together at the center of the bottom here. So if we unwrap a little, there's one corner of the rectangle. Here's another corner. Uh, fortunately, I'm tearing a little bit. It's hard to not tear tinfoil. It's very fragile. Uh, here is another corner. I think I've got all four of them up. And so that's sort of the bottom unwrapped. And then uh, this is pretty much the center of the material. Here, I have a, a picture of what it looks like to wrap when I'm very careful. Uh, this is one corner unwrapped, two corners unwrapped, 
uh, sorry, this is the original thing, one corner, two corners, all four corners. So you get this rectangle of material, uh, which is curious because it seems to be pretty similar to the square wrapping of the Mozart Kugel. Of course, here we don't have a sphere. This is a half sphere at the top, half cylinder at the bottom. But still, the seems to be like a square where you take the center of the square, except here it's a rectangle, uh, put it at the north pole, and then wrap around and the four 90 degree corners come together at the center of the bottom of the cylinder. Um, one curious thing though is that the um, this center, the, the, the north pole of the Krembo, ends up here, which is not in the center of the rectangle. And I don't know why that is, whether it's for some mathematical reason that I haven't figured out yet, or if it's just because of the labeling, the way things are printed and getting all of the uh, ingredients and so on to fit on there. Uh, could be a practical or a mathematical reason. Um, we can take the Mozart Kugel wrappings and sort of take half of them and f and find nice ways to wrap the spherical top of the Krembo. And so from that perspective, this wrapping or square wrapping looks fine. What I haven't really, f uh, what we don't fully understand mathematically is how you transition from the cylindrical part on the side, which is easy to fold. This transition, this lip on the bottom of the Krembo I don't know for sure uh, what a contractive mapping would look like there. Uh, so it's an interesting open problem for you to think about. How exactly does this uh, rectangular surface uh, wrap to make this shape? Uh, can we find contractive mappings? Uh, can we compute exactly how efficient this is for some optimized version of this? And can we do better by doing things like maybe a triangle or other shapes made of petals and things like that? So a lot of interesting directions to go for the Krembo. Uh, beyond Mozart Kugel was kind of easier because it was just a sphere. Here we've got the composition of two parts. It'd be neat to figure that out and do a similar kind of case study as we did for the Mozart Kugel. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about computational confectionery and and uh, computational origami. If you want to learn more, uh, there's this great movie. I'm sure you've already seen it. It features uh, Miri and Paul. Uh, among other origami artists and scientists, but it's a nice one-hour overview of the field. Um, if you want to see the more technical side of folding, there's this book called Geometric Folding Algorithms, which Joe Rourke and I wrote uh, a few years ago. It talks about origami and paper folding, but uh, more generally things like robotic arm folding, protein folding, linkage folding, and polyhedra folding. So lots of fun stuff there. Uh, a little bit technical. Um, and if you want, uh, if you like presentations and talks like this one. Uh, there's a whole series of video lectures of a class I teach at MIT called Geometric Folding Algorithms, same as the textbook. And I talk about on the blackboard, typically, uh, various uh, notes and algorithms and lots of fun stuff. So uh, if you want to learn things in more depth, in particular, there is a lecture about the Mozart Kugel and exactly how you prove that these mappings are contractive and therefore valid foldings of material. Um, you can check that out. Just go to ericdomain.org and click on classes and then folding. Uh, so that's it. I uh, hope you had fun. Thanks.